what a silly catastrophe we had where um, I couldn't get into Zoom since 8.38. So um, don't panic. We're going to do this anyway. So let's see what's a going on. So goodness gracious, we're going to throw the stone all the way back to Caravaggio and the conversion of St. Paul. So if I were to ask you um, what umbrella this fell under, you would probably say the Baroque. And if I were to ask you the system of extreme dark and bright spotlit uh, areas uh, that Caravaggio innovated, it would be Tenebroso, T-E-N-E-B-R-O-S-O. -E -E Remember that? And also, um, this is definitely Caravaggio operating under the Catholic Church. So this would be a Catholic counter-Reformation artwork. And what is this depicting? It's depicting an ecstasy or a moment when Christ directly speaks to um, one of his future apostles on his way to Damascus, which is modern-day Syria. This is another fabulous one. Caravaggio, look at that ridiculous slide. It's the calling of St. Matthew. Another one using raking light. Um, the moment of spiritual connection, Christ uh, speaks to Levi, soon to be uh, Apostle Matthew, Levi the tax collector. And you can see again the Tenebroso um, during the Baroque period for the Counter-Reformation. Uh, this is not Artemisia Gentileschi. This is the Caravaggio Judith slaying Holofernes. And you can see the Baroque curtain pulled back to show the very theatrical scene because part of the Counter-Reformation is a theatricality, the moment of the most excitement, violence, etc. Um, and there's certainly a lot of excitement happening here, um, even though she's sort of leaning back and sawing at his neck. She's holding his hair. The blood is spurting out. He's in mid-scream, but you're not going to hear it because it cut the vocal cords. It's a symphony of gore and excitement. Just fabulous. So if we just saw a version of it, then this must be the Artemisia Gentileschi version. So daughter of Orazio Gentileschi, um, excellent painter in her own right, did her own version of Judith and Holofernes. And here you have the jugular spray, you know, kind of jutting out this way and rolling down the sheets. And this muscular Judith and her young uh, handmaiden are holding him down so that they can sever his head and show it to her people. Absolutely fabulous. She is a Caravaggisti, right? She is a follower of Caravaggio. And you can see this, you know, dark, dark, tenebristic or tenebroso space in the background. This is also a Counter-Reformation artwork during the Baroque. Oh, so um, Gian Lorenzo Bernini uh, worked uh, for uh, the Catholic Church. He was their minister of their uh, classical sculpture collection. So he was well acquainted with Greco-Roman masterpieces in the Vatican collection. He was a devout Catholic and actively working for the Counter-Reformation. And his David is so fabulous because it is so counter-Reformation. It is the moment of the most extreme, most explosive movement and action and dramatic and psychological tension. His toes are gripping the plinth. His body is in full torque. He's biting his lip. There's a deep furrow between his brow. And this is the physical representation of the counter-Reformation and the Baroque being sort of super Renaissance. So if Michelangelo's David is calm and cool and humanistic and it's all on the inside reflected on the outside, this one is just absolutely fabulous. But as you can see with the drapery around the genitals, it's no longer about physical beauty. It's about psychological and mental fortitude. And this is Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa. Uh, again, um, important to the Counter-Reformation is actual connections between the divine and the average person. And so this was the Carmelite nun who experiences visions of angels coming to her and piercing her with arrows. This is a multimedia creation that Bernini makes. He makes an oculus or an eye letting natural sunlight into these bronze sun rays onto this spectacularly fabulous um, bron uh, I'm sorry, uh, marble sculpture. Diego Velasquez, uh, this is also Baroque. He is from Spain. And we're getting a look inside of the royal palace 
and this is absolutely incredible. It's about reflection and light and going into places you would never see. There's the Infanta Margarita of Spain in the center of her retinue of girls and assistants, and here's Diego Velasquez himself. This itself is an enormous canvas, and he's painting an enormous canvas, and here he may be painting who we see in the reflection of this mirror here with the Baroque curtain pulled back, the King and Queen of Spain themselves. It's amazing. It's almost like they're all looking at us. Uh, Velasquez showing off his virtuosity. And when we say virtuosity, we mean a virtuoso, somebody is who is so good at what they do. It's absolutely unbelievable. And this is the water carrier of Seville. So um, outside of a bodega or a drinking place, you would have a man who sells nothing but water. Uh, and so here are relatively young men coming out to have water. And here Velasquez treats the different textures of things so beautifully, the cloth and the terracotta and the water rolling down the front. And then this beautifully um, painted glass, you would swear it was real. It's absolutely unbelievable. And then this darkened space in the background, which highlights this very average person. So not kings and queens. Rubens. Oh my goodness. Um, this would be a triptych or a three-paneled gigantic altarpiece that Rubens painted on site uh, because it was so big and it was covered by a, by a curtain uh, to keep the drama going. This is called a repoussoir, R-E-P-O-U-S-S-O-I-R, or a dark space which highlights this fabulous, you know, counter-reformation, you know, image of Christ being elevated on the cross and all these muscular men sort of, you know, pushing him up. And then, of course, these Rubenesque, you know, very fleshy women. Look at that baby's thigh sort of you know, crowning around on the side and a very resigned Mary sort of glancing over at the scene. Absolutely spectacular orgy of movement. Um, this is Ruben's arrival of Marie de Medici at Marseille. This is incredible because um, it f fantasizes and aggrandizes a very ordinary thing that would have happened, which is the Medici, there's those Medici oranges, the Medici Marie showing up in France and the, the very symbol of France is sort of welcoming her in and nereids and uh, mermaids sort of frolic uh, underneath the gangplank sort of looking up at this fantastical scene um, in this large cycle of paintings that Rubens painted because he knew that the the best and the brightest would see these paintings and possibly commission him for even more. Um, Franz Hall's Women of the Regents of Old Men's Home at Harlem. It was considered a good deed for Protestant women to take care of the elderly or the infirm or the poor. Um, plain and severe clothing was adopted because again you can't you know you can't be showy and so this was very typical to see this sort of you know white um, shawl and then severe black clothing which before we would have uh, thought was like a, a Spanish courtier or something and so Franz Hals's uh, is doing what a lot of Dutch artists did, which was um, doing group portraiture. So each one of these women would have paid to be in this portrait. And perhaps if this was a bigger group and the people in the background um, would have been, would have paid a little less and the people in the foreground would have paid a little more. Um, this is the Night Watch, nicknamed the Night Watch. And this is again a group portrait, even though it looks like some sort of history painting or, you know, some sort of melee that he's showing. And he's actually showing something interesting, um, the new technology of the long rifle. So here's somebody loading it, and then it's hard to see, but here's somebody shooting one. You mistake it for the little feather here, but it's actually bang, this guy is shooting one, and then this guy is blowing out the powder and starting all over again. You have dogs running through the scene, and then this strange girl here, and she actually has a dead root chicken hanging from her waist, and that might have to do with the name of this militia group. Militia groups were um, assembled by, you know, sort of wealthy men who would pay to be in the militia. The militia would serve for a number of years, and then they would retire, and a new group would come in. So firemen and militia groups um, were, you know, sort of civic-minded people that would, you know, gather and sort of march around and have the newest weapons and halberds and flags, and then perhaps they would have their portraits painted, my goodness, by someone like Rembrandt. This is a fabulously violent um, image. This is the blinding of Samson. So when Delilah realizes, or Samson reveals to her, that all of his power is in his hair, 
um, as he's sleeping, she cuts it off here. She's running away with the scissors and the soldiers run in. And in order to completely incapacitate him, this man is shown stabbing a dagger into his eye in this cave scene. So dark and horrific, but this is a biblical scene. And this is sort of showing you these, all of these, you know, harrowing moments from the Bible that you don't often see. Um, Hyacinth Rigaud, Louis the 14th. So remember, 14th is the Sun King. And my goodness, here he is showing you how fabulous he is with this Baroque curtain pulled back. And look at this monumental um, column. So this is showing you that in Versailles, this column is massive. It's not going anywhere. Versailles isn't going anywhere and neither is he or his progeny or his children. Um, and he has the crown, the sword, and the scepter of power, and he's wearing his fabulous wig, and he's showing you his fabulous legs. He's in his 60s when this portrait is done, um, but that doesn't matter. He's been sort of softened, and he also was a big fan of ballet, and so he's showing you his fabulous legs. Um, if you were a member of his personal clique, you would paint the heels of your shoes red to denote that you were a friend of the king. Here he is covered in the fleur de lis, the symbol of France, and he's wearing an ermine um, cape, ermine fur, which is also the, the fur of kings because it was so difficult to acquire. So this is about, this is a portrait in the grand manner, grand manner portraiture. It's large, um, it's, 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 it's imposing, and yes, he is sort of looking down at you. He would have sent this to all corners of France to show uh, he would have had copies made of this to show that he was in charge, just as Augustus would have sent his image around Rome, uh, just as federal um, portraits of our president go all over federal buildings. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Jan Vermeer, the uh, allegory of the art of painting. This is possibly Vermeer himself, but nobody knows for sure. And this is, again, that curtain pulled back on a scene. And the Dutch loved to show maps in the background because of the Dutch East Indies Company and how they sort of ruled the seas. They're the bad guys in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. And here this is very uh, typical of Vermeer showing a natural light source. And you would swear it's real sunlight sort of illuminating a room. And this is a painter painting an allegory of the art of painting itself. So this is sort of like um, when you see a movie about making movies like Singing in the Rain is a love letter to Hollywood. Allegory of the art of painting is sort of a love letter to the art of painting itself done by Vermeer. Uh, Watteau's Return uh, from Scythera. This is a Rococo painting. So after all the severity of the Baroque, the Rococo rises and it's mostly about uh, the fête galante or the having a lovely time outside um, angels and pooty fly around, uh, people have trysts or sort of, you know, love affairs, wearing fabulous clothing outside in these fabulous natural spaces. And here they are leaving the island of love, um, where Venus uh, came ashore. Um, so it's absolutely fabulous. Here they are embarking uh, on, this, on this pleasure barge, and they're leaving, and there's this statue of Venus there. This is the swing by Fragonard. Isn't this adorable? So I want to show you all the little parts of this. So the most, the sweetest thing. So she, here she is on a swing. There's her husband and he's literally in the dark as he doesn't realize that she has a lover here hidden in the bushes, looking straight up her skirt. And there's her little mule heel. And even Cupid is saying, shh, like, don't tell the husband. And this one looks kind of worried, like this is not a good idea. And then look at Fragonard's treatment of the trees and the foliage. So it's like there's a spotlight here, but everything is this misty pastel. So this also is Rococo, and it's about fabulousness and frivolousness and silliness. Oh, and Clodion. Um, little tabletop terracottas, never meant to be painted or finished or fired or with a glaze or something. These are meant to be absolutely fabulous studies of nymphs and satyrs and about pleasure and fun and mythology. And no more the heavy emphasis on... Uh, you know, Catholicism or, you know, heavy duty, you know, uh, talks about religion. This is all about fun and frivolity. Uh, Joseph Wright of Darby, experiment on a bird in the air pump, full of drama, dramatic lighting, and something scientific going on. This is during the Enlightenment period. And this is a British painting, and it's very large, and it's very mysterious, but it's about the interest in science 
and barometers and thermometers being developed at that same time. And then this, of course, is removing the oxygen um, from an area and seeing if the bird will actually survive. Some people look on in rapt um, interest. Some are worried about the bird. Uh, some are interested only in each other. And this guy is sort of the Doc Brown of the entire scene, sort of looking out at us like, what do you think? It's absolutely phenomenal. Jacques-Louis David. So now we're swinging into neoclassicism or new classicism. So from the frivolity of Rococo, we go into serious, uh, you know, classical tales with moral stories. Here, when you see the three arches, it's not the Holy Trinity. It represents sort of equality and balance. And this painting is about um, nationalism and patriotism and honor and family and doing your duty. Um, if you were to see it through the feminist lens, uh, you would see this as that men are sort of steady and upright and strong and women are very emotional. You could think of it in the Greco-Roman way of this is an Apollonian virtue, being serious and um, steadfast and logical, and this is a Dionysian personality, more emotional, sort of like a victim of your own emotions. Jacques-Louis David paints a tribute to Marat, and here it says, Amara David. This is to Marat from David. Marat had been murdered in his bathtub by Charlotte Corday. You can see that here. She had come in to plead uh, lenience for her father, and he said no. And so she stabbed him with this knife here and then ran away. She was later caught and guillotined herself. He had a skin condition, so here he is reclining in the bath, but David makes him a martyr of the revolution. So even though David had worked for Louis XVI, at one point he ends up being an extreme Jacobin, this group of people that would rouse people from their homes and guillotine them by the thousands. So it was a pretty bloody time, the, the terror in France. Um, this uh, Angra, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angra, he... Uh, he came after David. He was also, as David was the uh, heavily involved in the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, which was established by Louis XIV. Uh, Angra also at one point was the director of the French Royal Academy. And here is uh, Grand Odalesque. And Odalesque is a Turkish harem girl. And here she is looking coolly back at us. And us is the Sultan, obviously. So we've come in and she's giving us that cool, fabulous stare. She takes up the entire painting from top to bottom. And all, here are all of these exoticizing elements, the hookah, the peacock feather fan, and the turban with this robin's egg sized ruby here, and then her fabulous nudeness. He does add vertebrae here, but that's to make her look extra, extra elegant. He, there's no bones in her arm, this leg comes out of nowhere, but it's Angra, so who cares, right? Henry Fuseli, The Nightmare. This is a Swiss painter, and this is the era of Romanticism. So the pendulum swings again, and Romanticism doesn't mean romantic like love, it means that nature and your inner self are very unpredictable and scary and sometimes overwhelming. And so here is a woman who is dreaming and caught in a nightmare. And this is making the nightmare, or get it, the nightmare, a female horse, visible um, by putting in incubus, sitting on her chest, stealing her breath and being sort of sexy. So is this blood pouring out of her or is she in the throes of a terrible, terrible dream? We're, we'll never know. Um, Goya. Uh, also um, is a romantic painter, but again, certainly not romanticized. This is about this sort of the swells of horror, um, you know, in life. And so the sleep of reason produces monsters is about um, that when you sleep, just like this one, when you sleep, sometimes you dream and awful things happen. Or the sleep of reason produces monsters when the people in charge go to sleep and aren't paying attention, horrible things happen. And in this case, he would be talking about the Napoleonic invasion of Spain. So Napoleon invades Spain and all hell breaks loose. So the bats uh, are folly and the owls are ignorance. And the most famous sort of recent history painting. So when you say history painting in the French academic way, you're talking about biblical or Greco-Roman history. But here, um, this is a recent history painting. So Goya is painting something that had happened just a few years before. And what had happened is this row of Napoleonic soldiers went to trouble some Spanish cities and they would sort of gather up all the rabble rousers and they'd put them up against the wall and shoot them. 
So this figure here that's spotlight with his arms up is known as the Christic figure or the Christ-like figure in this painting because he is sort of spotlit like Christ and he will be martyred for the revolution. And here's all the blood and brains. So this is part of Goya's black paintings. He had what pr people now associate as post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, this was painted on his kitchen wall. So Saturn devours one of his children. So Saturn is the god Kronos. So he's either saying time devours us all, all right? It makes you old, makes you decrepit. Or that um, Saturn being the father devours his children. So the king is the father of Spain and the king was weak and he let Napoleon devour everyone, right? So either way, it stinks. Jericho's Raft of the Medusa is another romantic painting uh, because you see this is about the sublime. Uh, the sublime is a concept where um, nature is big and exciting and breathtaking, but it's also terrible and mostly trying to kill you. So when you see a giant wave coming up and you're in this raft of a shipwreck, it's a pretty serious situation. And so here you have this giant wave coming and way in the distance is the ship that they've spotted. And this man on top represents that France had abolished slavery and so he's one of the survivors of the ship Medusa. The Medusa had been filled with a bunch of officers and the captain who were hired through nepotism for who they were, not how accomplished they were. So when the ship ran aground along um, South Africa, uh, the officers went away and the crew made a raft and a lot of them died and a lot of them were eaten by sharks and there was cannibalism. It was horrible. Unfortunately for the officers, a lot of them made it back home. And uh, they, there was this big uh, trial, and it was a big, big national scandal. Delacroix, this is also romanticism, so death of Sardanapalus. So, you know, then when they say you can't take it with you, well, when he was being defeated, he said, sure, I can. I'm going to kill the horses and the women, and I'm going to burn the buildings, and I'm taking it all. And so this is him sitting, you know, monstrously, dispassionately watching everything go while he's being served, you know, his drink. So this is supposed to be violent and sexy and scary and unusual and crazy, um, as the sublime is. This quiet painting is also about the sublime. Uh, Wanderer above the sea of mist, Caspar David Friedrich, showing you that there you are, taking it all in, but that you have to realize the religiosity of this moment, that you're a small speck in the world and that the world is so big and giant. It's almost inconceivable. And this is a, such a beautiful painting, and it is about the sublime. Constable's the Hay Wayne, England's favorite painting, because it, and a Hay Wayne is a hay wagon, and it really is a looking back, that when you come home, there's somebody at home, there's the smoke, and you could do an honest day's labor out in the clean air on your own land, and everything was pretty groovy uh, before everybody moved to the cities and the Industrial Revolution sort of chews people up and spits them out, and there's prostitutes and homeless children and beggars and typhoid and diseases and pollution, and it's pretty awful. So this is about sort of the purity and the warmth of home. Corbet's The Stonebreakers was um, painted the year after Frederick Engels and Karl Marx's The Communist Manifesto, was released and that's about sort of the proletariat or the working against the bourgeoisie and so this painting is pretty miserable and it's saying that this miserable job of stone breaking to create gravel for roads is generational and that poverty is generational this old man um, this young man will turn into this old man they'll never go anywhere they're the whole concept of America and you can sort of be who you want to be is not here um, and it's in miserable colors and Corbet sort of liked rabble rousing and he tried to show this at the Academy and people, you know, hated it. Um, it was bombed and uh, lost in World War II. Edward Manet, Déjeuner sur l'herbe, or Luncheon on the Grass. So um, when Manet delivered this, he was quoting a Raphael. Uh, so he thought, oh, this is fabulous, home run. But his loose brushwork, his known models, so this is his brother and his brother-in-law, Victorine Marant, and then this, uh, you know, Godzilla woman in the background, this seriously comically ridiculous um, non-academic style brushwork uh, he gained, he was scorned and derided as much as Courbet, but of course didn't enjoy it as much as Courbet. And he was arguing that this is the way your eye really sees. It doesn't gather up all of this sort of subtle, you know, uh, gradations of light and shadow, that this is what you really see. And then he, uh, two years later, showed Olympia, 
which people hated even worse. He said, oh, I'm going to do a reclining Venus figure, except it's Victorine Marant again in a known place. This is Paul Nikkei's bordello being handed flowers from a client of hers. So see these dabs of paint, but we can read this as that she's laying on a shawl, but people thought this was absolutely beastly um, and that he was terrible. This is the pre-Raphaelite movement. This is a British movement of people who said, by the time you get to Raphael in the Renaissance, he is the epitome of everything that they don't like. He is too perfect, too um, too organized, too posed. They wanted to get back to the truthfulness of the medieval. They liked Shakespearean subject matter and things like that. And so this is Ophelia. This looks like a Northern Renaissance painting if you look at the detail in the flora and the fauna. And of course, poor Ophelia, you know, drowning in the river. Uh, this is called sequential photography. Edward Muybridge took sequential photography to settle a bed of all four horses hooves ever leave the ground at one time. And of course they do, but then this creates his book, which he released in 1889, over 130 studies such as these called 130,000, excuse me, called animal locomotion. And he toured with his magic lantern, um, slideshow display. And he showed all sorts of things like this, but this sequential photography had never been done before because of slow shutter speeds. Think of the daguerreotypes and the 30 second shutter speed. You couldn't even capture a human. And now shutter speed is getting quicker and quicker, which of course leads to motion pictures. But when modern artists see this, they freak out. Daguerre. So still life in studio. This is the 30 second um, shutter speed and photographers are still arranging their images as they would a still life. So you're still not doing real life. You're sort of arranging things very sort of um, artificially. Uh, Monet, Impression Sunrise. So this group of painters wanted to call themselves the Independents, but the name Impressionists stuck. And Monet was arguing about um, optics and the science of optics and how your eye really sees color. And again, it doesn't, like Manet was saying, who was a friend of Monet, you don't gather all of this information about the delicate transition between light and dark. You see it as you see it. And here, of course, we understand we're seeing a war from ships coming in. So this is a revolution, and this is the beginning of really the modernist period in art. So the complete breaking away from the tradition of the French Royal Academy with the no visible brush strokes and the perfect perspective. And now because of the influence of photography and Japanese prints, we're seeing acid bright colors, flattening of space, loosening of brushwork. And so to demonstrate optics, he paints the facade of Rouen Cathedral over and over and over again at different times of day, at different seasons, to show you, to prove that it really is light and season. It's not anything else. Um, Kaibo, Paris, a rainy day, absolutely fabulous, housemanized Paris, brand new, uh, wide boulevards, cobblestone streets, cleanliness, you have street sweepers now and people who take away the trash. It really is truly absolutely fabulous. Um, Renoir, Moulin de la Galette, this is another impressionist masterpiece. An afternoon after everybody's off of work, they're going to dance, they're going to have fun in the dappled sunlight uh, with friends and children and arguing couples. This is Degas. He was an avid photographer, which is why you see so much cropping in his work. So here's these feet coming down the spiral staircase, feet down here, and then these crazy floorboards, which is very Japanese print, also these crazy bright colors. So it's like a snapshot of a moment, and he loved depicting ballerinas. Um, he also loved, uh, influenced by Japanese prints, going into the brothels like a modern painter should, said Baudelaire, um, being a flaneur. And you go in there and you use more immediate um, art media. And in this case, it would be pastels or oil pastels, right? So, um, Mary Cassatt is an impressionist painter. She's an American living in Paris, very wealthy. So she's not bopping into the brothels and the bars and the cabarets. She's going to the opera or she's doing things in the home. Um, you can see the influence of, of Japanese prints and impressionistic brushwork here with these, you know, pattern upon pattern upon pattern upon pattern and the sort of strange angle, but it's absolutely fabulous. Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec is a post-impressionist. So no woman is green. I don't care how much optics go in. He is, sh and no sort of, no uh, handrail is this bonkers. This is Japanese prints plus absolute artistic freedom. And here you have these people at the Moulin Rouge or the Red Windmill Cabaret doing what they do best, which is drinking and shooting the breeze and looking fabulous. 
This is Seurat. This is another post-impressionist, but this is Pointillism, P-O-I-N-T-I-L-L-I-S-M. And this is little, little dots together to have your brain and your eyeball create a true purple or a true blue. So instead of showing you purple, they might put red and blue together, red and blue together, red and blue together to make your eye create purple. So there is no purple unless your eyeball creates it. And this is very similar to Moulin de la Galette by Renoir. This is a bunch of people enjoying the afternoon and the nice weather in the modern city, um, but it's pointillism. See even this pixelated edge here. This was added by Seurat, and he dies early, and since this is such a laborious, you know, slow-moving process, he only created a few canvases um, in total. Uh, Van Gogh is another post-impressionist, not painting optics and light the way your eye truly sees, but painting how you feel. So visual brush strokes, visible brush strokes, influence of Japanese prints and photography, but again, how you feel. Um, this place he called a terrible place full of violent emotions and broken down people. And so he's showing you these vibrating, miserable lights, sort of this, this man standing here, the morose people, this sort of strange fun house uh, look at the floorboards and sort of a place where you go to just destroy yourself. This is looking out of his asylum window at the town. This isn't accurate. A lot of this is sort of imagined. Um, it always reminds me of Night on Bald Mountain in Fantasia, where Chernabog comes up out of the mountain. Um, but you can see the visual movement of stars, and uh, it's, it's very sweet, even though it's very sad. Um, Cezanne, so this is the keystone of modernism, that he decided uh, that he broke with the Impressionists, that he thought they didn't have enough logic behind what they were doing. He said, I don't want to do any of the trickery, I just want to operate on a couple of principles. Warm colors come forward and cool colors recede. But I want to be able to show weight and mass of objects by using very little trickery. And so what he's doing is black outlines and then, you know, sort of very simplified shapes. Not a lot of transition. Warm colors coming forward, cool colors receding. And when Picasso sees this, he freaks out because you're also seeing multiple perspectives. You're seeing the table from above, you're seeing the basket from sort of the side and below, you're seeing the table from this wonky angle, so you're seeing it like this all over the place. Henri Matisse, woman with the hat. So this is fauvism, wild beastism. Uh, this is crazy. They're using uh, colors that they feel like using. There is no woman who's green and yellow. Um, they're using emotional colors, whatever they want to do, visible brushwork. Uh, the unreal becomes real. It's art for art's sake, the flattening of space. See how there's no attempt to make this illusion of 3D? So this, at one point, Matisse was the most, you know, uh, avant-garde painter, which means advanced guard or ahead of his time, of the time. Um, Vasily Kandinsky, he was part of the Blue Rider movement. He finally takes abstraction to a form where he is trying to describe music, but visually. He is non-representational, so there's no, that's not supposed to be an egg or a flower or something. It's supposed to be completely and totally abstract. Franz Marc was another part of the Blue Rider movement. This is the fate of the animals. Um, this is the end of the world where the um, wolves are howling and the animals sort of are turning on each other. The horses are fighting and snapping at each other and drawing blood. It's it's miserable. It's, it's all over. Um, this is Kathy Kolovitz. Her youngest son dies in World War I, lifelong pacifist, works mostly in woodcuts and etchings, and a lot of her work is um, incredibly emotional. Kaiser Wilhelm I, or the second, called her work uh, gutter art. And then later, uh, during World War II, she was afraid to leave the country of Germany because she thought that um, Hitler would exact retribution on her family, so she stayed. This is Gertrude Stein. She was an American writer living in Paris. She was, a, she was as helpful to Picasso to find a new visual language as uh, Emile Zola was to Manet when he defended his painting Olympia. Uh, he did a portrait of her. He, she sat for it 90 times. Um, he, then he X'd out her face and used one of his collection of African and Oceanic masks. Uh, when her friends said it didn't look like her, he said, it will. And then later she said it was the closest to her anyone had ever come. And of course her portrait had been painted many, many, many times. This is proto-cubist. He's working out cubism, looking at Cezanne's paintings like Basket of Apples. And he's showing you uh, women or prostitutes laying down, standing up, squatting, coming out the side of a door. 
and he said to work on something or to achieve any sort of intensity, something has to be a bit ugly. But people hated this, they derided this, he showed it, people hated it, and then he hid it again for 13 years. This is still life with chair caning. This is a collage. Collaire is from the French to glue. So he, what he, this isn't real chair caning, it's actually wallpaper with the image of chair caning here. And you're looking through the top of a cafe glass table at his breakfast or his eaten breakfast and his tape his chair pushed in so there's la journal or the newspaper but jouet also means to play and he's showing you his toast points his little um lemon wedge his coffee cup and he's done with breakfast and moving on it's so cute um here is his statement to generalissimo francisco franco who invaded spain and allowed hitler to try out blitzkrieg on the little town of guernica so um Hitler drops bombs on Guernica on market day when the old ladies and the, the kids are out, slaughters everyone. Picasso hears about this when he's working on the 1937 Paris World's Fair and he freaks out and he immediately paint, starts painting this enormous painting. So I've seen Picasso standing and he only reaches about the top of this like broken implement here, the broken sword. Um, this is deliberately done in black and white because Picasso wanted it to be news because no one was really talking about it. And he does these dots and dashes here because it's news. So again, it's newsprint. He wanted everybody to know or the horrors of um, what was happening in Europe. <laughs> this adorable painting is the beginning of um, Italian futurism based on Edward Muybridge's sequential photography. So showing the man as machine, the man is moving with movable parts. So this is adorable, dynamism of a dog on a leash. But the Italian futurists were, had sort of a darker tone. They wanted to unmire Italy with its obsession with its glorious past. So no more emperors, no more Renaissance. We want to talk about the future. We want to talk about men with replaceable parts. We want the cleansing effects of war. So when World War I came along, they all joined, and Boccione, this artist, dies in World War I, but Filippo Marinetti, the, the kind of leader of this Italian futurist movement, becomes Mussolini's um, minister of culture during World War II. So here, the, the, the sort of the classical Renaissance sculpture has completely transformed into the futuristic armor-like man in motion. It's absolutely fantastic. This is Dada. So after World War I, everybody was embittered, and they said, if all of these geniuses and big brains got us into this, then nothing means anything. No, art doesn't mean anything. The one-of-a-kind doesn't mean anything. The artist's signature doesn't mean anything. All of our institutions are kind of garbage. And so what Marcel Duchamp does is he goes to a hardware store. He buys a urinal. He calls it Fountain. He signs it R. Mutt. This isn't the original. This is one from about 1950, but he signed it all over again because the original one-of-a-kind doesn't matter. So this is called a ready-made. This is called a rectified ready-made. So he goes to the Louvre, he buys a postcard of Mona Lisa, he puts a goatee and a mustache on her, he says, elle est au, au cul, or she has a hot ass, elle est au cul, and he signs it. And it's taking away the sanctity of these, you know, master one-of-a-kind paintings, he's changing her gender, he's goofing around, he's not showing any respect, which is so Dada. Um, Russian constructivism. So Vladimir Tatlin goes to Paris, meets Picasso, freaks out, becomes a cubist, comes back to Russia and applies cubist strategies to his constructions. This takes six months to build and um, it's never really proposed for a real thing. It's just um, a symbol of Russia's aspirations, that things were going to be absolutely great in the future. This has been on like their postage stamps and stuff. So it's going to be three buildings stacked upon one another that project things into the clouds and rotate and things, but it was never really built. Um, Marcel Duchamp again, Dada. So this is again showing how Italian futurism and Dada were sort of closely connected with their love of sequential photography and showing the man as machine. So this was at the time called Explosion in a Shingle Factory, but it was really amazing because again, it was showing the human as like sort of a, a collection of moving parts. And this is so opposite of everything that we've seen with the Renaissance and the Baroque and then the French Royal Academy. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so then Dada moves on to surrealism or the shuttle of the inner mind. Uh, so they start to say, um, let's look inside. And uh, along with Sigmund Freud's, you know, kind of breakthrough landmark new observations about 
the human condition, the id, the ego, and the superego, is there a way that we can tap into these, you know, hidden, deeper layers of ourselves? And so the persistence of memory is a tiny little painting, but what it's saying is that all of these things that we take as true, like that time is an actual scientific measure that you can measure, um, he's saying it isn't because then th some days go on forever and some days go like this. So time is malleable. Time can be stretched and pulled over yourself. That time is a construct of your mind. This is a little um, like portrait of Salvador Dali himself. Looking back, of course, time is always connected to memory on Spain. And then this is a Freudian concept of tickling desire, little ants crawling all over you. So it's very loaded with Freudian imagery. Rene Magritte is another surrealist. This is often connected with the idea of semiotics, introduced by Ferdinand de Saussure. Sometimes it's called Saussurean theory of the signified and the signifier. So, of course, the signified here is pipe, and the signifier is the word pipe. And so Rene Magritte, in a very surrealistic way, says, Cicini pas un pipe, this is not a pipe. But, of course, it is a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. But then, technically, it's not a pipe because it's not really a pipe. It's a painting, so it isn't a pipe. He's right. But then again, it is a pipe. And then you go back and forth and back and forth. And that's so Rene Magritte to play with your wanting a conclusion. I want a, a nice conclusion to this story. And there is none, which is what makes this ridiculous painting one of the greatest paintings of all time. Pete Mondrian is still wrestling with the reductive quest of abstraction. So during modernism, the whole thing, if you're going to paint abstract, is reduce, reduce, reduce to its most pure form. So Mondrian says, okay, I'm only going to use 90 degree angles and the three primary colors of red, blue, and yellow, which are the Superman colors, if you ever have trouble remembering, and then the two non-colors of black and white. Little did he know that Kazimir Malevich in Russia in 1913 had already done white on white square, so he already won the game, but Pete Mondrian doesn't know that. And these are very cool, you know, interesting. Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. So this is about um, living in America. This is an American painting in the big city and how empty and lonely they can be. Um, fluorescent light had only just been invented in the 1940s, early 1940s, and so this was brand new. But see how all the storefronts are empty and all the windows are empty and there's no sign of life. Um, there's no food and food is happiness and sharing. This couple looks like they're alone, even though they're together. There's a door for him to get out, but there's no door out. So this whole thing is this quiet, dark, psychological look into kind of modernism and how you're alone in a crowd, even if you're around other people. Grant Wood, this is called regionalism. So this is American Gothic, or and this is actually his dentist, but this is like the American farmer. And um, it's amazing. It's just about plainness and seriousness and the treatment of trees as these little lollipops. I, I urge you to look into Grant Wood paintings. And it's very, it's very stark. There's no frills about this. That's the whole point. Um, there's slideshow. Was that it? Oh my gosh. Okay. Excellent. So I want to get to the beginning of the slideshow so that the, well, I guess I'll talk over this so that the subtitles continue. I want to lecture you extremely briefly on uh, continuing your college degree. You, if you have a major, please consider getting a minor as well. Sometimes it's a matter of just 12 to 15 more units, and you're already taking 12 units a semester to keep your financial aid rolling. So why don't you pay attention to the classes that you've already taken and tack on the ones that will give you a minor in something? I'm begging you, please don't major in something silly like liberal arts or art or something. Um, please get an actual degree because it won't be cute when you're in your 40s and you really, really need to make money that you sort of went, I don't know what I'm doing, and you sort of got a whatever degree, you're going to you're gonna regret that. Um, I was in my 30s before I figured out what I was doing. I went the wrong way this way, and I went the wrong way that way, and finally I settled on something that I was actually able to do. But I, I know a lot of friends in their 40s who really regretted um, not getting a degree, not finishing, or at least because there's no way to go back. So be a phlebotomist or somebody who who pulls blood or an x-ray technician or, you know, a, a dental assistant or a dentist. Dentists have more take-home pay than some surgeons do. Or um, go into chiropractics. Be a health inspector. Um, so you have to take environmental health classes and you would get your own car, your own badge, and you show up at restaurants and kick some butt. Think about a profession that will pay you. 
uh, especially if you can get into the city or be a state worker, holy moly, then you've got a pension. You will, you will pat yourself on the back when you're in your 40s that you made this decision. You have to talent stack. So God forbid, if you must go into art, for heaven's sakes, if you're going to be a graphic designer and do computers, then get a minor in like art history or something. So you can say, yes, I have a full background in art history. I know what I'm doing. So if you ask me to do something Baroque, I know what you're talking about. Or something like that. Get something that underpins your uh, degree. Also, if you're over 18, you can, you can open a Roth IRA or an IRA. And if you take away 200, as much as you can afford of your financial aid every year and throw it in your IRA, if you have $10,000 in an IRA by the time you're like 25 and you let it roll, by the time you're 65, you'll have $700,000. So please just, as you're young, not in a traditional savings account, but go see a financial advisor. You don't need to pay them because they make their money in enrolling you in these funds and stuff. Please go see an advanced financial advisor now. Let your money start rolling now so you have oh my God, money. So, oops, you need all four tires for your car. Well, you can go back and take it back. Please take care of yourself financially. Look at the classes you're taking, sort of make a plan, talk to an advisor, get a minor at the very least. So you're going to be majoring and minoring in something or double majoring because it doesn't take that many more units to have a much bigger and more impressive degree. You're already in it, so just do it, okay? You've all been absolutely lovely. And um, I'll be on campus on Mondays next semester, so hopefully we'll high-five um, at one point. But wow, this has been a fun class. I'm sorry for all the Zoom wackiness. And I hope to see you guys soon, and please do well on your final. All right. I'll see you guys soon.